Good evening. I'm going to start this out with a W O W. Wow. <laughs> so I'm Bill Doley, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. How many people know that we've been doing, this is our 10th season of doing these archaeology cafes? Okay, a lot of you have been there before. How many, is this your first time? Welcome, welcome. So this, as I said, this is starting our 10th season of these archaeology cafes. Archaeology Southwest is a private, nonprofit organization. We're based here in Tucson. We work all across the uh, U.S. Southwest. We try to share information about this, the U.S. Southwest and the Mexican Northwest. We've got 15 employees. We are uh, doing what we call preservation archaeology. There's a little bit of research uh, that's ongoing with our, our program. There is a lot of public outreach, and this is one of our public outreach uh, efforts, which is the Archaeology Cafe. So this is <clears throat> a program, this Archaeology Cafe, it brings in a professional archaeologist who is passionate about what they do. For the first nine years, we crippled their thumbs. They're so used to pressing the little um, forward button to make a PowerPoint go forward. Uh, we have not allowed people to use PowerPoint until tonight. So that's a new advance is, is tonight. We have uh, a visual component. And the goal is to ha basically create a conversation between a professional archaeologist and the community. And it's wonderful to see so much of the community come out in an, in an evening like this. Let me move now to introduce our speaker. Jim Vint um, is the individual who led the field effort out at <clears throat> the, so most of us would call them a sewage treatment plant, but they're, <laughs> they're water reclamation facilities. You're just all wrong in what you think. Um, so, <laughs> out at Ina Road, and so over a year's worth of field work uh, that really exposed this early farming uh, activity out in a scale that we had not realized before, uh, and Jim will put it together. This is, has been the topic of his dissertation at the University of Arizona. The work out at the uh, water reclamation facility was funded by Pima County, other work, the work out at the Sunset Road site where the footprints were located, that was also funded by Pima County. Arizona Department of Transportation and the City of Tucson have also funded major projects that, that have revealed this 4,000 years of agricultural history. So without further ado, let me turn you over to Jim Vint, who worked for Desert Archaeology for that year out in the field and has recently completed a doctoral dissertation at the University of Arizona, Dr. James Vint. So tonight, I'm going to just quickly take you through um, about 4,000 years of agriculture in the Tucson Basin. Tucson is here because of the Santa Cruz River. It's an oasis like most rivers in the uh, Sonoran Desert. It, it's a corridor filled with wonderful lush riparian woodland. Uh, it's attractive to all sorts of birds, animals, plants, and people. The river is why Tucson's here. Uh, Hugo O'Connor founded uh, the Presidio of Tucson in 1776 based on the uh, springs and, and uh, flowing river at the base of A Mountain. And in fact, uh, the base of A Mountain is where some of the earliest agriculture in Tucson uh, uh, was practiced, uh, dating back to at least 1500 BC. My focus here will be on what we call the early agricultural period. If I make it move. Bill crippled my thumb, apparently. Um, we'll take a brief intermission. Um, anyway, um, the early agricultural period um, is of interest in um, the greater Southwest. But it's when maize was first introduced. Uh, uh, to this region of southern Arizona and northwest Mexico. Um, the earliest dates uh, in the Tucson Basin 
that were first documented in the mid 80s by Paul and Susie Fish uh, fell um, between about 1200 BC to AD 60. And that's based on the uh, resolution of the radiocarbon uh, dating technique at the time. And it was the first direct date on, on maize in the Tucson Basin. Since then, um, we've continually pushed the, the age on early maize back in time. Uh, okay. Um, it works better if I have the pictures. Um, <laughs> there we go. When? Okay, when? When will it work? It works now. Okay, so we, we have about 2,000 years or so of what we call the early agricultural period. And this is pre-pottery, pre, pre hohokam Currently, we date it from about 2100 BC to shortly after AD 1, so up to about AD 50. Over those 2,000 plus years, uh, agriculture became slowly but increasingly important in, in life ways of the people here. Uh, during this long period, agriculture really never provided more than about 30% of the overall annual diet. It would vary over the course of the year due to when crops came ripe um, and then would be supplemented with wild foods um, and provided a very flexible and resilient diet. I won't quiz you about these different phases, but um, here we go. Does it not work again? Bill, you cursed my thumbs. Um, so we call it the early agricultural period. We start with maize. Beans and squash don't enter the picture until about 800 BC in the period that we call the early Sienega phase. At that time, then you have the, the, what you consider the traditional suite of the three sisters of corn, beans, and squash. Um, a lot is made about the uh, contribution of beans and squash to the, to the maize diet and providing a complete um, protein complement. But uh, interestingly, um, amaranth provides the same uh, contribution of lysine and, and other important amino acids that the, that the squash and beans did. So the early portion of this time period had a, uh, what you would, could consider a complete agriculture diet, um, complete uh, nutritional diet based on agriculture. Okay, here we go. Um, here's, just to uh, give you an idea, here's that first date on maize in, in the Tucson Basin that Paul and Susie Fish got from Tumamak Hill. It falls to between about 1200 BC to 80, 80 50 or so. And uh, then in the, the mid 80s, uh, Bruce Huckle uh, began his work on early agricultural sites in the Tucson Basin and the uh, Cienega Creek area. And uh, Barb Roth was doing her dissertation research in uh, the northern Tucson Basin. And uh, th they uh, submitted maize samples to the U of A radiocarbon lab. And, by that time, the resolution of the, of the dating method had increased, and so you can see the precision of these dates falls within a much tighter time span than what Paul and Susie got, and it, and it established that maize was being grown as early as between about 1200 to 800 BC during what we call the San Pedro phase. And uh, other sites in uh, the Cienega Valley east of Tucson provided dates that fall um, after, eight, after um, 800 BC. By the mid-90s, due to all the work along the, the interstate um, and development of, of I-10 and infrastructure like the sewage plant or water reclamation facility, we, we now have well over 200 direct dates just on, on maize. Um, and uh, the dates keep falling earlier and earlier and earlier. Starting in the, in the late 1990s, some dates uh, were recovered from very good contexts at the sites of Los Pozos El and El Taller and Clearwater that were er earlier than the San Pedro phase. And so um, that begged the first question of what is early agricultural period, when does it start? And so uh, we accommodated it to say, well, it starts at around 2100 BC. We, we'll, we'll just uh, split that out of the middle archaic and include it into the late archaic early agricultural period. And so agriculture became even older. And now, um, in the last 10, eight years or so, we've gotten dates from Los Pozos and Las Capas that fell, fall much older than 2100 BC. So now we're, we're at a point that uh, we have to really start questioning ourselves, uh, what is the early agricultural period and when does it actually start?
So uh, we're in this conundrum now of wanting development because we want to be able to dig these sites. Um, but, but we also uh, want to make sure that uh, we don't go tearing everything up. So that, that, that provides uh, some interesting questions to what's happening in northern Mexico and uh, points further south. I, I think uh, recently there has been at least one date from the site of La Playa in northern Sonora near Magdalena that uh, is around 2200 BC. So we're starting to be able to connect the dots and uh, with hope uh, we'll be able to put all those dots together and start seeing a better picture of the movement of people and agricultural technology moving northward from, from, uh, from Mexico. So in the Tucson Basin, uh, early, the early agricultural settlements pretty much occur where there's water. And uh, I don't think this is really a, a, an artifact of archaeological sampling. Um, anymore, uh, as the late Dave Gregory said, anytime you put a backhoe trench into the floodplain of the Santa Cruz River, you pull up an early agricultural site. Um, we've now excavated over 25 uh, sites that date uh, from about 2100 BC up to around AD 100. And the majority, as you can see, lie along the Santa Cruz River, that, that oasis um, that used to have surface flow along much, if not the entire stretch, except for brief, brief intervals. Um, there was almost always surface flow from about Tumamoc Hill to around uh, Fort Lowell and from about the Rito Creek up to uh, what would be up here, uh, past Ina Road, several miles. And then in the intervening areas, uh, depending on uh, prevailing climate and rainfall, you would get either very shallow subsurface flow and high water tables or occasional uh, surface flow, which is ideal for, for growing maize, which is a very water thirsty crop. We also see agriculture being practiced in the, in the eastern Tucson Basin along Tanca Verde Creek, which also in this area used to, before 49ers Country Club and the golf course, uh, had uh, high water tables. And then at areas along the foothills of the Santa Catalinas and even the Tortolitas where there were emergent springs and uh, people were taking advantage of that to, to grow maize, plus or, mi plus or minus 1200 BC. So what do we see archaeologically in uh, these early ag sites? Well, this is Las Capas and some of the fields that we exposed at, this, at the site, uh, which is now underneath the Tres Rios Water Reclamation Facility at Ina Road and I-10. Not every site was like this. A lot of sites were smaller. People were, were planting in smaller plots, taking advantage of marshy areas, um, Akchin farming at the mouths of arroyos. But in locations like here at uh, the water reclamation facility or the base of uh, Tumamoc Hill, where there was always emergent flow, people were investing in building uh, irrigated field systems as early as 1500 BC. Um, the site of Las Capas dates primarily to about 1200 to 800 BC. And over that, that course of 400 years, they developed um, a very sophisticated uh, field system now, when you think of canal irrigation in the desert, you think of Hoacom canals, those big monsters that you see up in Phoenix. Uh, most of the canals down here were small, you know, maybe a max of two meters in diameter and maybe 40 centimeters deep, uh, very much like uh, modern uh, acequia field systems in northern New Mexico, which are still in use today. We, we estimate that at its peak, at around 800 B.C., Las Capas, uh, the field system could have uh, encompassed as much as 15 hectares or about 35 acres uh, at, at its highest point. And interestingly, a lot of those uh, sequia systems in New Mexico um, approximate that same size. Now, Capas is unusual. Um, so uh, we can't think of this as the typical uh, early agricultural period site. Um, the, that single site focus, like what um, um, Hoakam archaeology suffered from, from everybody thinking that Snake Town was a typical Hoakam site or that Grasshopper was a typical um, Mountain Mogollon site. But it shouldn't be considered an anomaly. Fred Niles, our, our uh, geomorphologist uh, on the project, uh, modeled river flow and estimated that 
based on those points in the river where we knew or, or can hypothesize regular water flow that up to about six communities of the size of Las Capas could have been settled at the same time. And in terms of population, um, we have estimated that Capas uh, ranged in population from about 95 to maybe 140 people. That's based on uh, guesstimates of how much food could be grown in those fields, how much labor it takes to construct those fields, how much labor it takes to maintain the fields and operate the irrigating uh, cycle, as well as to you know, perpetuate the overall uh, community structure. So we can figure that along the river between, you know, at around 800 BC, give or take 100 years, there may have been 700 or so people living along the river itself and then an unknown additional number of people living um, at areas like uh, Milagro on the eastern Tucson Basin and other smaller uh, farming localities um, in, the, in the foothills. Now, th this seems like I'm talking about people who are really tied to the land. And yes, they're becoming increasingly anchored to place. They're investing in this agriculture, but there's still quite a bit of mobile foraging going on. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, maize and other agricultural products probably didn't comprise more than about 30 or percent or so of the overall annual diet. I don't think that's uh, minimizing the role of agriculture. Uh, I think it's it's speaking to the, the effectiveness of a very flexible uh, farming technology that our, um, our uh, ethnobotanist Mike Deal calls farmaging, where people um, invest both in farming domesticated plants as well as emphasizing um, foraging for wild uh, plant foods. Um, in addition, these uh, fields uh, probably looked more like our backyards and alleys in monsoon season, just as much amaranth and other uh, weedy annuals, uh, what we call crop weeds, as there was maize. Amaranth is a very nutritious plant, both the greens and the seeds, um, purslane, um, goosefoot, and so forth. Um, all of those um, weeds grow very vibrantly in disturbed soils along uh, um, any any place where there's where there's water, you know anybody who gardens in the in the southwest probably has suffered or benefited from from that. Um, so the the early maize, uh, it's not it's not Iowa corn. It's not what we think of as Pueblo corn. It was a small eared uh, popcorn variety. The ears were probably eight to ten, maybe twelve centimeters long. Uh, we don't know the exact land race. People have compared it to a, a land race variety called Chapalote, which is a, a popcorn variety that's uh, still grown in northern Mexico. It's a very, very nice corn, but uh, we don't think that uh, they are closely related. We, we did some studies of comparing uh, what are called phytoliths, um, the, the silica lining of plant cells um, from corn cobs from these ancient maize cobs to phytoliths from modern Chapalote, modern Pueblo flower corn and modern popcorns, and um, they they are not similar at all. The the uh, the ancient maize looks nothing like the, the the modern varieties, and there's been some recent research on the DNA of um, ancient maize uh, from uh, early agricultural sites up through late prehistoric uh, sites, uh, done by Kelly Swartz, and I forget which university she's out of now. Uh, but she so shows that these, a, a lot of these early southwest land races are very different from a lot of the, uh, the modern um, um, heirloom races that, uh, that are still grown in, in northern Mexico. And some of the, some of the this is, these are some of the phytoliths I was telling you about. Here, here are maize phytoliths here. Um, th th these are specimens that we recovered from the, the agricultural fields at Las Capas. So we know we can now directly prove that they were growing maize in those fields. And another interesting thing was we recovered these uh, phytoliths that are in the squash family. Now, and I, I mentioned earlier that we didn't think that people were growing squash before about 800 BC. Well, we still don't think they were. We think they were growing bottle gourds, uh, Lagenaria. This is a modern um, Tohono O'odham uh, water gourd, uh, Lagenaria phytolith, compared with one of the uh, Phytoliths from the Las Capas fields. So, 
the uh, the botanist who did this analysis is pretty pretty comfortable in saying that um, uh, bottle gourds were grown during uh, at least the San Pedro phase, 1200 to 800 BC here in Tucson. Now we don't have any charred macrobotanical remains. We don't have any carbonized seeds or carbonized rinds, but uh, but we have this, so we like that. Another interesting thing are these uh, silica items, which are from freshwater sponges. These were also recovered from the irrigated Las Capas fields. The sponge gemosclere is the, the reproductive organ of freshwater sponges, and sphere asters are part of the, the uh, skeletal structure, along with spicules, which are long kind of toothpick-looking things. Now, the, the interesting thing about this is freshwater sponges require clean, clear, flowing water um, that is... Um, flowing for at least eight to nine months out of the year. So this talks about the health and condition of the Santa Cruz River and the water that was being taken into those fields. So um, as far as we know, um, uh, we think these are the first identified sp freshwater sponge remains identified in the Southwest, which is kind of cool. Now, in addition to the farming, what were people doing? Well, typical architecture are these shallow pit houses, um, shallow depressions with a brush superstructure. Quite often they have an interior storage pit. Uh, they occur, uh, we found them occurring in, in clusters of three to five houses, presumably relating to household groups. We also have a number of large bell-shaped storage pits. You can see the size of them here. This fits five people. There's actually five people in there. Uh, Ernestine is pregnant. So <laughs> then um, in terms of material culture through time, um, at Las Capas provides some of the interesting example of this. We have transition of projectile points through time from early San Pedro from about 1200 BC through time to the Cienega phase. Now Cienega phase is not represented very strongly at Las Capas, but th these are from Tucson Basin sites. But at Las Capas we have in the early occupation from about 1200 uh, BC to around 900 BC, um, the overwhelming projectile point style or what we call empire points, these three here. Um, and then after 900 BC, uh, San Pedro style points become uh, the most common. And our lithic analyst, Jane Sleva, uh, based on analysis of sites throughout uh, the Southwest, that uh, these uh, empire points, uh, which occur in a very restricted range at a very few number of sites, represent um, probably uh, the, the movement or migration of people from uh, northern Mexico up into the Tucson Basin. And um, the only two sites in Tucson with um, more than one of these points is Las Capas and then just ca across the river uh, another site uh, that, that has quite a, a large number of them. And she, she uh, is proposing that based on the technological variation that, that this represents um, uh, population movement. And what happens when people move, they bring with them their agricultural knowledge, they bring with them social organization, they bring with them all sorts of elements of culture, I ideology, and sometimes conflict. Ritual paraphernalia, um, the, the fallback of archaeologists, I don't know, it must be ritual. We have uh, uh, the typical figurine styles. Um, again, these are examples from Las Capas. These date to the early period at Las Capas from about 1200 BC to 900 BC and correlate very strongly to the um, presence of these empire points. After uh, about 900 BC, we see this, this style of figurine, which then um, becomes pretty much the, the, the most common variety. People have offered explanations of rites of passage, field fertility, human fertility. Uh, Jim Heidke wrote an interesting article comparing these to uh, kind of an animist belief of bringing of corn being a living member of your community. It's a very Udo Aztecan uh, kind of approach to to uh, the role of corn in society. And um, then pipes. This is a stone pipe here, a vesicular basalt, and these have. A, a bone uh, mouthpiece attached to them. This one is missing it, and then this is a clay pipe. Interestingly, in the Tucson Basin, uh, pipes are only found in the early agricultural period. Uh, they disappear from the archaeological cultural record after about 800 BC, and in the, uh, after that time in the, in the greater Southwest, American Southwest, they're only found in the Pueblo world. 
So um, there's another interesting uh, avenue that I think we need to, to uh, explore in terms of population movement and the spread of, of farming technology and people throughout the Southwest. Speaking of population movement, uh, th these people in the Tucson Basin were connected far and wide. Um, we, have, we have good evidence of regular contact and, and communication between the site of La Playa in Magdalena and the Tucson Basin and points further. These are uh, um, examples of shell jewelry. Uh, many of these are nacreous shell species from the um, Sea of Cortez and the uh, California coast, southern coast. Chris Lang could tell you all about them. Uh, we have spondylus or spiny oyster. I won't go out on a limb on any of the others. But also interesting, we have two pieces of turquoise, uh, turquoise beads, which uh, again um, hadn't been recognized in, in early ag uh, context before. These uh, eight items, seven items, no, nine items, uh, were, were found clustered together, uh, probably a little bracelet uh, that had been dropped, in, uh, and we found it in a field context, <laughs> luckily enough. So the importance of agriculture, the introduction of maize, I don't think, and many, many other people uh, don't think, that it w had the transformative effect on population that um, is attributed in, or seen in, in, the, in Southwest Asia, you know, the Neolithic demogra demographic transition. When agricultural, agriculture was introduced and people settled down and made villages and population boomed, that didn't happen in the Southwest. Um, we had a long, slow, inexorable commitment to, to agriculture, um, over which time I think the major changes were in social organization, how people worked together, how people planned their, their season and had to cooperate even more with each other, uh, particularly irrigation communities who were drawing water off the river. Um, you know, the people, you know, like Mark Twain said, uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. Um, the people downstream, even with this low-level, small-scale irrigation, people upstream were taking water out that had to get downstream. So um, the important thing, I think, was, was that cohesion of community, tethering to place, and uh, commitment to place that builds a community. I mean, even... Now, uh, they, these are uh, limpia uh, groups uh, at uh, Ezequias in northern New Mexico where annually everybody gets together. Uh, a ditch boss brings together that community of 80 or 90 guys, gives them a eight meters of ditch that they have to clean. And that's a time when people catch up on what's going on. They resol resolve disputes. They, they catch up on news. Um, that marriages are, are arranged. Uh, there, there are some interesting ethnographies of you know kids from from Truchas who have moved to L.A. and they come back annually for for the for the Olympia because that 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 is what what makes them um, a member of that community. Yes, early maize is cool. The older we, dates we get, that's great. But I think the important thing is is what we see in what it did to social organization. Um, and at that point, at this point, I'll. Uh, turn it over to you and you can ask me questions and I'll try to answer or you can debate amongst each other <laughs> yes. okay what was uh, social organization like in in Tucson before the introduction of maize and uh, likely migration north um, the archaic period uh, prior to agriculture were it was largely small bands, quite mobile, following seasonal rounds. Um, probably focusing on the river valleys in, in, the, in the spring and summer, and uh, then moving up into the foothills uh, in the fall when, when certain things like acorns and other things were coming ripe, and, and following game. And um, a change in mobility, I mean, late, um, the earliest occupation in the Tucson Basin dates that, that we have dated, it probably goes earlier, is about 8,000 BC. And uh, we don't have many excavated sites um, at all from, from these early ones. I mean, you could probably count three sites that date 
between about 8,000 and 6,000 BC. After about 6,000 BC, we start seeing more use of the foothills, like in the Santa Ritas, the foothills of, of the Catalinas, and along the, uh, the um, Santa Cruz River. Now, one of the interesting things about that is by about 4,000 BC to 3,000 BC, we start, um, based on our very huge sample of two excavated sites, um, on, along the Santa Cruz is, is the use of riverine resources, particularly seed-bearing grasses, dropweed, sporobolus, um, and some of the others. And um, some people, I think rightly so, argue that this provided a, a pre-adaptation of sorts uh, for people to in, incorporate maize in, into uh, the diet because they're already working with plants on the floodplain knowing you know, the conditions that these seed-bearing plants like and when to harvest, how you might you know, clear areas to encourage the growth of the sporobolus. Um, and we see that elsewhere in the world. Uh, you know, the Amazon basin, there's a lot of this kind of opportun well, it's not opportunistic, it's very deliberate, burning and clearing of, of areas along rivers to, to create these, these uh, settings for these wild plants to, to, to then grow in in a uh, greater density than, than that might occur naturally. And th that's one, one of the things that, uh, that I've argued about early um, farming here is that it's not so much an intensification of production, it's a um, control of production. It's making sure that you've got a pot of land that you can consistently get food from, whether it's maize or the amaranth and pigweed and goosefoot that, that grows when you have a failed maize crop or vice versa. So it, it's a control of your resources, not for, for quite a while rather than, than an intensification. First one. Um, agave, that's a good question. We, um, we don't really have much evidence of agave use. Um, before about, oh, I don't want to misspeak, but before about um, 400 BC. And that's just based on the macro botanical remains we've recovered from sites. And I don't have a, a good reason why that might be. I mean, um, the number of agave roasting pits and, and rock piles that have been tested by the fishes up and down the tortolitas and so forth, and I, I got to count rocks in those for many years in the 80s, um, uh, none of that dated before about 1200 AD. Um, so, but in contrast, in, in southwestern New Mexico, West Texas, you get a lot of agave and yucca roasting. So, um, I, I, I don't have a good answer for that other than either um, yucca wasn't a focus. We, we do have a lot of use of saguaro fruit, um, prickly pear fruit, and other other uh, uh, cactus uh, fruit, but but not not from the Lilacea family. Um, the the, uh, the phytolith from the Lagenaria uh, is very different from like Kusha squash or 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 some of the other uh, winter type squashes. So uh, the, the reference samples that he compared them to, uh, we have you know very high confidence that it's the Lagenaria. Uh, and with hope, you know, we'll get better answers for that. You know, I would, I'd love to be disproven and have, have it shown that, that, uh, that uh, we have uh, true squash being grown here. Um, uh, I know that there's been squash found in McEwen Cave, and um, I look forward to the dates coming back from that. Um, but I'm going, I, I go out on a limb on this, but uh, this, uh, We'll turn Carl Whitfogel on his head and, uh, and a few of the other people who looked at water from the, the point of view of uh, state-level societies. Here we're dealing with primarily small bands, um, if we want to use the, the, the Solons and Service model of social organization. We don't have the social complexity of state-level societies, but we have people who know their, their area. They, they know what the river does throughout the course of the year. They know how to take that water out of the river and onto their land. It's not, not at the level of, of the, the hydraulic despotism that, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, you know, the, the classical scholars talk about. But uh, again, it's, it's, it's a nascent technology. It's people 
incorporating this, this new way of living into what was still a, a, a foraging, hunting economy. Um, but this commitment to, I mean, you, you can't just put corn in the ground and, and watch it pop up and then go away and hunt and gather and come back because the ra you know, rabbits, deer, whatever, other people are going to come and mess with it. So it's, it's taking care of your property. It's, uh, it's, it's, I guess, the simplest answer. Hunting uh, comprised a fair amount of the diet. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, as agriculture was introduced, we see a lot more uh, consumption of, of cottontail rabbits and, and jackrabbits and a, a slight decrease in the amount of, of uh, larger game such as uh, deer and mountain sheep. Um, uh, you know, we've tried to play numbers games and you know, I, I flippantly throw out numbers like maize wasn't more than 30% of the diet, and you know, how how do we put uh, uh, the the meat consumption in there? Um, I'd say it's uh, significant, but not dominant. Um, as far as fish, we know there was fish in in the in the Santa, were, were fish in the Santa Cruz, fish in the, in the Gila. Um, I, a lot of that is recovery te techniques. Um, or in archaeological analysis techniques, I think we've probably underemphasized trying to identify those remains um, in flotation samples or, or designing field work to recover samples where those those might be preserved. So, some some of that uh, um, species representation, I think, is a methodological um, issue. Yeah, that's that's an unanswered question. I, I think what we see over those two thousand years um, is that that slow climb, that slow. Um, if you look at the the the, nat the physical nature of the sites that we've excavated, uh, we see through time um, greater investment in architectural building, uh, um, storage facilities like the pits. Uh, food processing um, features, you know, roasting pits, uh, ground stone tools. Um, there's a, a slow shift from a more mobile use of resources that don't require an infrastructure investment to through time. It's a, it's a, it's a, I'll cop out and say it's a slow change. And I would gladly have anyone give an answer to that, because I'd like to know too. Uh, at this time, we don't have um, a lot of evidence of the early agricultural period up in Phoenix. Um, I think some EAP stuff has been documented on the Gila River community. Uh, I've not, I don't know if they've uh, published any of the reports on that, but I think uh, one, difference here, at least in terms of the use of the rivers, is the difference in the kind of river. The Santa Cruz is a much smaller stream. Um, it's uh, more dependent on, on the runoff and high water tables created by the, the, the catchment of the, of the Tucson Basin and, and Pantano Wash, Santa Creek, as opposed to the, the Salt and Gila um, up there in, in Phoenix, which are, as you know, uh, Paul, huge rivers and go through these large, large surges of, of floods in, in the spring. Um, so um, I, I guess we're missing th that that archaeological picture up there. I, I, I would bet, you know, dollars to known us that there is EAP uh, material up there. Um, you know, it's like when in 77 when Dave Doyle said that the Santa Cruz was basically an empty niche until about 900 AD, um, based on the fact that we hadn't dug along the Santa Cruz. Uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe we just need to go dig up more stuff in Phoenix and, and you know, and finally, finally get that missing picture. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, sponge colonies are, are you know, as you know, very variable in, in their morphology and size. We don't even know the exact species of sponge, but I've, I've sent these these um, images to various sponge specialists um, across the country, and they all said, yeah, that's a gemisclear, but I <laughs> can't tell you anything more. And one of the funny things is that, that uh, sponge fear aster, we sent a, a, a test 
uh, sample of sediment to a, a Phytolith uh, graduate student in Missouri, and he identified one of those as, as a uh, palm tree Phytolith. And palm tree Phytoliths do look kind of like that. They're spiny little globes. But sponge uh, sphere asters, I don't know if you can see it here, but they have a little hole, which, uh, which uh, the palm tree uh, ones don't. And um, the, the guy who did my Phytolith here um, he specializes in wild rice up in Minnesota, and he goes to, you know, global phytolith conferences and all these things, and, and he, he went to a meeting where somebody presented uh, palm tree phytoliths from late Pleistocene sediments in Michigan. And um, <laughs> he said, no, that's, that's, a, that's a sponge. I've seen them, <laughs> you know. And so out there in the literature, there, there are probably um, sponge, freshwater sponges that have been identified as palm trees. Uh, and w when we first got that, that initial report back, I, I, I was kind of worried. I thought, gosh, do we, you know, what's going on? You know, are they bringing up more than maize from, from Mexico or, or the COFA, you know? <laughs> but... Uh, um, uh, now that we have you know a whole suite of these gemmascleres and sphere asters and spicules, uh, we we know that that they are freshwater sponges, and that means the Santa Cruz was a very healthy, clean river. Yeah, I, I did a, uh, a kind of a quick literature search of sponges in Arizona, freshwater sponges in Arizona. Uh, the only examples I found uh, were um, a uh, water treatment plant in Prescott, whose water filter um, system got plugged by them, and then the Phoenix Zoo had a water filtration problem uh, with them, and then somebody found uh, sponges in um, uh, uh, the, the water turbines in, uh, uh, was it Horseshoe Dam or something like that? And, and they're, they're all interpreted as, as modern, modern intrusives. So. Well, um, in terms of using the maize, the, the masa um, uh, would have been, uh, something they could make into tortilla-like or cake-like uh, things. But in terms of bread, as, as you and I think of it, wouldn't be until uh, wheat was introduced uh, by the Spanish. But uh, the, the maize itself would make a very good tortilla, uh, tamale type thing. And one of the things we did with uh, um, the chapalote, because we, we, we planted some experimental plots to see how, how the maize would do using similar technology to this. Um, we uh, harvested the uh, chapalote at various stages from when it was still green on the cob to the time when it was dried. And the, the green uh, uh, chapalote popcorn was very soft and sweet, and you can grind it and make it into a paste that you could uh, either then dry and save for later, or you could cook uh, on a griddle or a hot rock. And it's very sweet. And um, the sweetness of it is, 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 is another that I'm getting off on a tangent here, but um, one of the hypotheses for maize domestication is the sugar hypothesis, that, that the plant itself was sweet. And it, it was domesticated as much for the, the sweet sap in its stalks and in the green cobs as it was for being a source for dried kernels. And um, uh, the, the, the chapalote that we grew out here I measured the sugar content of the, the, the stock sap, and that uh, came out um, to a, a, a measurement of, of bricks, which is the amount of sugar in solution that was as sweet as, as modern hybrid asparagus. The, uh, the sugar content of the green, uh, uh, ground up green uh, corn kernels was as sweet as modern day uh, hybrid sweet corn. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's another thing I think that we need to change as archaeologists is our perception of how maize was used when it was still first being incorporated into diet. We tend to think of, you know, you get into these, these kind of um, traps of, of, of using the same models over and over. I mean, this, this uh, I think we need to think of, of this maize um, consumption is something completely different than the way the hoacom did. It's not flower corn. It's, uh, it's not um, um, something that you store a whole lot of for use later. It's something that you use when it's young, when you need to use it, and make sure that you have enough saved as seed to grow the next year. 
with maybe a bit of a buffer um, that you can either um, eat as popcorn in the lean season of the spring or, or um, trade or, or um, you know, eventually plant. Uh, no evidence of teosinte, although uh, I did mention that the phytoliths, the, those silica lining, cell linings of the, some of the uh, samples we submitted from um, Las Capas had an archaic trait. Um, the, one of the phytolith analysts suggested that the, uh, what she calls the ornamentation of the phytolith was reminiscent of teosinte, suggesting that it may indicate some hybridization or retention of, of some of these, these very old, old botanical traits that hadn't quite been bred out of these early land races. Um, that's a question that's still being resolved. Uh, most of the early maize that we've had to work with are ca is carbonized, so we, we don't have a lot of the, the attributes that, that could distinguish those, those uh, variables. Um, it, we were lucky to extract phytoliths from the carbonized uh, specimens that we had. Now, C Kelly Swartz, the, the, the woman I mentioned earlier, she's working on, on that very question. Um, what were the what were the land races like from you know earliest introduction through time and how did they how did they diverge in terms of selection for either flower traits or dent traits or popcorn traits um, and um, uh, that that's a question that's still being uh, resolved in terms of, of the specific land race varieties um, I think flower corns uh, show up. <laughs> Uh, what, around 300, 400 A.D., 500 A.D., somewhere in there. Um, I, I, may, I may well be wrong on that, uh, but it's much later than, than this early stuff. Uh, <laughs> what did they smoke in those early pipes? Um, we don't have direct evidence uh, of anything at this time. Uh, we can use ethnographic uh, analogy and suggest that it's either um, uh, wild uh, tobacco or some other um, um, smoky leaf. Um, we uh, did, uh, from one of our projects, we did recover a pipe that still had charcoal intact in the bowl, and um, that was identified as mesquite charcoal, presumably for igniting what was ever put in. And then there was another, I think from the stone pipe site, uh, the eponymous, um, site name. Um, uh, a pipe had residue in it which uh, Jonathan Mabry sent to R.J. Reynolds and had their uh, uh, chemist try to extract residue from it, but uh, he couldn't uh, get anything that, that registered diagnostically on the gas chromatograph that, that they did, so uh, we can only speculate. Um, that, that's a good question. I don't know. What was corn smil silk smoked? Um, I don't I don't know if uh, if in the Pueblo world if corn silk silk was smoked or not or or elsewhere uh, that'd be something to I'll have to put that bee into Jenny Adams' ear uh, to see if uh, she can track that down. And I was just told that that was the last question. So um, so thank you. Thank you.